Hey everybody, it's We Got the Beat. I'm Michael. That's Mindy. Woo! Yay! Yeah, see, I'm, I'm trimming it down to make it easier so I don't trip over my own words and, and screw up the intro anymore. Um, this episode's kind of a weird amalgam episode. We started off with one thing and realized it wasn't that much of a show, so we quickly, and then quickly, like I think you watched everything like this morning <laughs> for the second half of this yep. episode. So uh, most of this is Nickelodeon. And uh, yeah. if it's not a Nickelodeon show, Nickelodeon clearly had the influence to get the, the other thing made. And um, what's interesting is sketch comedy for kids didn't exist, I think, before you can't do that on television. I don't recall anything for children. Maybe the Muppets, if you count it, but not with actual human beings. Mm, I don't think I'd count that. Yeah, that's the only thing I though I can consider like, oh, this is well wait, is Sesame Street sketches? It is, isn't it? I don't think it counts. Okay. But this is something clearly aimed for the teenage audience. Though, of course, they had uh viewers that were younger. You and I both watched it before we were teenagers. What? Uh, you can't do that on television. We were watching that I think we were oh, like yeah, six yeah. or something like that when we discovered it. And of course, we didn't get to watch it all the time because we didn't have cable. Um, we went to a family member who did have it. And I feel like Nickelodeon was a big, big deal. Even more so than, like, what everybody else in our age group seemed to be obsessed with was MTV. Yeah, I, I don't honestly remember, and we've talked about this before, and how, like, I don't actually know what was normal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I just, I just think that I... Like, I, I think I just did what I wanted to, and I didn't care. I didn't really care what other people were doing. I feel like... I don't know if that's the explanation. I feel like a lot of my conversations got blank stares through most of my youth. Like, uh, what did you guys do this uh, weekend? Uh, oh, you went to a party? Hey, did you go see Major League Two? <laughs> <laughs> like, shut up, you dork. Stop talking about movies all the time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys yeah. know this band called Queen? And this is before Wayne's World made them cool. No one gave a shit about Queen for a while there. It's just funny how we were like mm -hmm. fucking nerds, man. Like, our hit bands were like Men at Work, which were like five years earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, uh, side tangents, just a moment. Yeah. But uh, nothing stops me dead in my tracks like when Men at Work comes on the radio. Yeah. And that actually happened to me the other day on my way to work, and I was like, oh, no, I'm going to be three minutes late. So I, <laughs> I don't even care. I'm still, at this age, discovering stuff from the 80s that I had no clue about. And I was like, how did people mm -hmm. not tell me about this? You know, Sisters of Mercy, The Cure, Susie and the Banshees, they're fucking great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, I think you just find, you find things in the time that you need them. Yeah, and it's... It's funny is because a lot of the stuff that we watched was always kind of on the cusp of normal anyway because we were watching uh, all that syndicated lower budget stuff, reruns on 55, which became the Fox channel. But I think everybody in, in a somewhat decent sized city had a channel that was like, we don't have any money, we can only afford these obscure things. Well, that was Nickelodeon to a T. They had no original programming for a long time. I think their first original show was Double Dare. So they're riding on British and Canadian and just weird imports that they're getting for nothing. And I remember in the morning, it was always like pinwheel, you know, that the, the little kitty stuff. And then the afternoons was kind of the middle school, elementary school maybe, but mostly middle school uh, age group. And then at night when they introduced Nick at Night, holy shit, we went crazy for like, the monkeys, uh, Martin and, uh, what's that, Rowan and Martin's laughing, you know, stuff like that. Oh, God, I kind of forgot about that. You know, one of my coworkers the other day was like, she's like, what do you mean you grew up watching the monkeys? You're, you're the wrong, like, age for that. And I was like, I couldn't remember what I watched it on. I said, oh, I think it was, I was always watching this stuff on Nick at Night, but I don't even know for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're the age group that, well, I guess people have it now with Friends, where shows from 20 years earlier 
sometimes 30 years earlier yes. was normal for because that's what you would watch when you got home from school you know uh, 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 leave it to beaver uh, bewitched and I think like if you wanted a newer rerun it was something crazy like Brady Bunch which was only like 14 years old and people were like what <laughs> but really it boiled down to syndication right that's yeah. how we were seeing this yeah stuff. and then cable yeah. of course the cable was weird because they couldn't afford the big packages of shows so they would pick up shows that usually were, oh, this is on for a year or two, and we'll just air this every Saturday at midnight, you know, like Square Pegs is how I discovered that. Um, and I think that's what, uh, you can't do that on television, stuff like that, where they're like, well, we can't afford our own programming. We're going to go out and see what's available that has some history. I'm shocked they never picked up Degrassi. Yeah, uh-huh, I agree. That's one of those that seems so obvious, because by that point... I don't even think they're even in high school. I think they had just entered middle school. Because Degrassi is interesting because you're watching the evolution of these kids through their entire school life. Because I believe it starts off like in third or fourth grade and then moves its way up. Um, I don't know about the first series, it, but the you know reboot of it that I, wa I watched a decent amount of. I think it really starts around sixth grade or so. Um, so it's like middle school through high school. Okay. The interesting, the interesting thing, like again, I never watched the original series, but the the like reboot was like the kids of those kids. Oh, interesting. I'm shocked. So a lot that... of times, some of those actors from the original series came back and were playing parents and stuff. You can't do that on television. Has never really been picked up again. There's been no real like. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's. Because it's a Canadian production, but also it feels like it's a very particular... You know the guy who plays Les? Uh, you know, he plays every male character, every adult character in the show. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I, th he, I think he owns the rights. And I believe he passed mm -hmm. away. And that he's just not going to let anybody else do it. But for our generation, this was like such a strong cult hit. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I watched it constantly yeah and there's an era where we really were like we knew that particular cast uh moose was uh the main girl and there was lisa who talked all the time um uh not asriel um i can't remember the one kid that kind of took over he was the shorter one with the brown hair kind of squinty eyes and then i saw like episodes later where i was like who are all these people i don't recall like seeing mm -hmm. the later years um but, but I don't I, know. I'm not, I honest. I honestly don't remember things very clearly. Okay, and of course, uh, it's, it's 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 talked about a lot that Alanis Morissette was on the show, but she's like in ten episodes. It's not that big of a deal. It's just that's where the first thing that she had done. Mm hmm. Yes, and she was the one person who from it that became famous. Right. Did you um? Alistair, that's his name, Alistair. Uh, and then one of the other kids, he works a lot. Like, we were looking him up, and uh, he, he's one of the only kids that's had, like, a, a career. Like, he was on the show for five seasons, and he's had a bunch of other yeah. stuff. But in general, these were kind of, like, just kids just playing around. And once they were done with the show, that's that was it. They just – because what he did was yeah. cast real kids. He didn't want to cast, like, actor actors. That's what I was going to say, that, like, with a lot of this stuff that, that I was watching – you can tell that these are just normal kids who weren't, like, I feel like, you know, since the, maybe the late 90s, or maybe even sooner than that, I don't know, was, like, everyone who was involved was, you know, even if it's, like, a game show and they're supposed to be normal people, they're really actors who are, yeah, like, yeah. just trying to get their face on TV. These kids were not like that. And, you, and it was interesting because it was so... Um, it felt very grassroots and very like minimal everything, and they didn't even cut, they didn't cut that much. It was all a little awkward and unprofessional, but I mean maybe that was part of the charm. Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, you do have a couple adult performers. Um, of course, Les and Abby played the the mother and father, or just any sort of adult character. But Christine was an adult at the time they made the show. She came in. Um, I believe season three because the show really isn't you can't do that on television until then. Um, it was a weird yeah. like I don't know, like a kids version of SNL. They had musical guests. 
Uh, they had kind of a flimsy premise. They really hadn't worked out the kinks. And I think once they got Christine in, a.k.a. Moose, um, in uh, as like not really a host, but like kind of the center character that everything revolves around. Um, yeah. That's when they kind of get the format down. And I bet you that they streamline the production of the show by like having every single locker scene. You know when they, they hop out of the lockers to, to tell yes. their jokes? Or, um, you know, like when they're in Barth's, the uh, most disgusting fast food joint in history. Stuff like that. Yeah. They probably shot every single one of them at once. And then just, you know, after they did all the shooting for a few months, they slowly edited everything so that you would see it like a normal sketch show. I don't know, maybe. You I know, mean, that would probably be a smart way to do it. Yeah, that's how uh, Jim Varney was able to do his TV show, if you remember that. Hey, Vern, it's Ernest. Is that's mm -hmm. how they shot it. They would do everything. If it was set, if it was on a set, they shot 13 different versions, or 13 different sketches on the same set, and, and they got it all done in like in two months so he could go back to doing his movies. Because I bet you they only really had these kids during the summer. Oh, I see. That yeah. makes sense. I mean, if they're not professional actors for the most part, I imagine they're just doing it during the summer and then they have to go back to school like normal. Right. Yes, probably. Maybe instead, not so instead much. Of going, instead, of, instead of going to summer camp, kids, you're going to go be on this TV show. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the, this is where we get the slime, which still, I believe, goes till today on uh, Nickelodeon, like especially with their, what is it, the GAC Awards is what that, that war show that they have where they slime people randomly? I think it's called the Teen Choice Awards. I feel like that's something else. I thought there was a Nickelodeon GAC Award. But um, do you remember when you could buy the slime in stores in the toy section? No. No? I don't remember, but I'm sure that was a brilliant move on their part. Yeah, they had that, and I think it was Nickelodeon Flome. Oh, were the two things they introduced like in the early 90s. Yeah. I kind of remember that. I'm pretty sure the Nickelodeon slime was the same exact slime that they had in the whole He-Man toy that uh, a family member of ours had. Do you remember that nasty, greasy shit they would cover the He-Man toys in? No. Oh, okay. I think, I I think that there's things that, that I've like blocked out. I don't know. <laughs> But, um, of course, there's the slime whenever you said, I don't know. And uh, what is it? Did you just have to say water to get wet? I can't remember how you got splashed. I think you literally just have to say water. I feel as though I am very ill prepared for this conversation. <laughs> but did you, but you saw like the greatest hits episode, right? The one I sent you? I think that I just watched several episodes so maybe i did watch that one yeah okay but there's a thing that i i truly it's hard for me to believe that they would be surprised when that happens when they get slimed or sprayed with water and yet every single yeah. time they look like they're just like what the oh you're like completely shocked i don't know if they're just like their head is somewhere else trying to remember their lines that they're not thinking about what they're saying and then they get hit I mean, I guess if you're saying something so innocuous that is that you would just say in a normal conversation, that it would it could really catch you off guard. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the very first time that they ever made the slime, that I shit you not, they made they just let food rot in the fridge for a week. Ew. Yeah, and then they poured it on the person, and that person <gasps> went home sick. <laughs> and they had to stop production, so they had to come up with something else, which I believe is just corn syrup color and something, you know, like something like gelatin. I can't believe someone thought that was a good idea. Let's pour rot rotting food on people. Yeah, children. <laughs> Fucking nasty. Oh, that's, I wonder if that person got fired. Yeah, I, I bet oh. you <laughs> somewhere in there is the seed of the whole Barth's diner. <laughs> oh, yeah, that sounds like it would make sense. There was that. Why do people keep going back to bars is what I want to know. Because they're always throwing up and he's always talking about rat burgers and stuff like that. And this is like, why would you go? Uh, I think that we're supposed to just forget about that part. 
That actually became a running joke at my last job. I was telling someone about the show, um, and his catchphrase was, I heard that. <laughs> and we would run around the back room and, and doing this to each other on a regular basis. <laughs> and people were like, what are you doing? Oh, it's a very particular thing. But there's there's yeah. that. There's the, uh, the and It's funny is a lot of his characters seem the exact same because the guy who owns the fast food joint is also like very much like the father. Just he has a much bigger gut. <laughs> same voice. Yeah, it's possible that he wasn't really that much of an actor either. No, no, I think because he's also playing everybody. He's playing the production guy, you know, with the headset on, who's telling him what to do on the show. He's playing uh, the general that has them uh, up against the wall, going to shoot them, but he always gets shot. Uh, I thought he was pretty good, but those two characters are way too close for my taste. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything you want to say about this before we move on to the next one? No. Okay. I just thought it was like, I'm going to be honest, like, especially the early episodes, I was like, this is weird yeah. and really chaotic. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't work until about season two or, th or season three when, like I said, when they introduced Christina, she kind of becomes the head writer. She left the show... A, because by that point, I think she was 26, and she doesn't really come off. You know, it's a teenage show. It's hard to keep selling her as a teenager. But also, she created yeah. a really short-lived, very obscure TV show that uh, I was obsessed with called Turkey TV. Oh. Do you remember that at all? I don't recall that either. Yeah, that was... Oh, God, what's wrong with me? No, no, no. no. It was literally 13 episodes. It was just short films from all over the world that she edited, that she found, that she curated, and made little sketches like just it was weird amalgam. It's kind of like a YouTube idea now, where you have a mix list of all these just random sketches and little clips. Well, she was just way ahead of her time. Yeah. So as that was wrapping up, Nickelodeon needed another sketch show, and they tried with Welcome Freshman. And I don't know if you watched it. I did. I didn't think it was very good. I just kind of told you to skip it if you hadn't already watched it. What? So, uh, you didn't get to watch that one, right? Yeah. No, I took your advice and didn't yeah. watch it. Uh, we yeah. were really crazy about it when it aired. Remember, Sunday mornings on Nickelodeon were kind of a big deal because that's when they had Ren and Stimpy, Clarissa Explains It All, Doug. And I want to say the last hour was always uh, Welcome Freshman in 16 or 15 or whatever it started off as with Ryan Reynolds. Listen, that... Oh, yeah. I remember that, sort of. Yeah. I mean, I definitely watched some of it, but um, I have to look up this Welcome Freshman to know for sure. It's, it, was, uh, it's, it was four seasons, I believe. The first two are all based around a theme, so they would have sketches around that theme. And they had a really tall, um, goony, bald principal that we thought was hilarious, but everything else is terrible. Now, here's the problem, I think, with a lot of the shows of this time period, is that they're shot in Florida. And they don't have the same kind of people to choose from. It works for our next show, but it didn't work for Welcome Freshman and some other ones. But Roundhouse works because those are adults. These guys have clearly like got their training in. They're doing theater shows. You know, I guarantee you that Roundhouse was a weekly, maybe, um, I don't know how they filmed it. But it feels like something that they would do for the tourists that would come to Universal Studios where they filmed. And they did it every single day, like four times a day, you know, whatever, maybe more. And they have it down oh. pat. The rhythm and speed of Roundhouse is insane and truly impressive. Yeah, I think that that was one of the things that was really appealing about it is that it was super high, high pace intensity. But it... I, what did I say to you? I said it feels so much more um, sophisticated. Yes. Yeah, it's it's much more rehearsed. It's it's something about it. Like, and of course, you and I, we went to the theater all the time as a kid, so we already had an appreciation for it. And I think I had done background work on Wizard of Oz in middle school. I don't know if you had done theater yet, but we both had kind of an idea. It, it, it's an aesthetic that we liked, and I think that's why Roundhouse appealed to us. And plus, 
we were huge fans of Newsies, like instantly the first time we saw it on video, and all of a sudden we're seeing like three or four guys from that in this show, and I think they just kind of grabbed us. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I remember for sure being, uh, oh, that guy's from Newsies, and I think that I was obsessed with that for approximately, oh, until today. So, um... <laughs> Have you noticed um, on Disney, that, they, they changed the name on Disney Plus. It is not Newsies, it's Newsboys. I looked the other day and I was like, what the fuck is this? It's Newsies, what are you doing? You, you want to know something else that I noticed? Uh, I, that's not the only time they've done that, although I didn't notice that one. I'll have to go look. That They actually did that recently with um, Z uh, Zootopia. Yeah. They like changed the name of it on the Disney Channel too. Last time I was on there, it was like... Zoolandia or something. I'm like, Weird. hey, what? What the fuck? What? Changing the anyway. title of something after it comes out confuses the shit out of me, and they keep doing it to Tom Cruise. <laughs> um, you remember when it was called Edge of Tomorrow and not Live, Die, and Repeat? <laughs> and uh, the new Mission uh, Impossible is small... real? Yeah, it's now called Live, Die, and Repeat, and then in small letters it'll say Edge of Tomorrow. Um but uh, Dead Reckoning is no longer Dead Reckoning Part 1. It's just Dead Reckoning, and they got rid of it, and they're going to add a new title to this, the next one. Because I think people were like, I don't know if I want to see just part. You know, that's the thing that teenagers would do. Adults that see Mission Impossible don't want to see Part 1. This is my hard-earned money. I want to finish the fucking thing. <laughs> that's so strange to me. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, I can understand maybe the Part 1 thing, but, I mean... I guess you don't have to commit to any decisions anymore, do you? Not really. Um, wow. So Roundhouse was co-created by Buddy Sheffield. That's not a household name by any means. But if you find out that he's one of the co-creators of In Living Color, things make a lot more sense. Yes. Because... Yes. Uh, like dancing. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he left, and I read the whole history of In Living Color, and it is really difficult, and a lot of people suffered because of Keenan Ivory and his ego, and then all of a sudden just dropping his complete and absolute interest in the show to go work on movies and left everybody just hanging. Um, and he would burn through Ugh. cast members, creators, writers like crazy. I mean, he makes Lorne Michaels look very, very patient. Um, so Buddy Shelfo got the idea of if we did something like In Living Color for teenagers, especially since so many teenagers were watching In Living Color, but if you look now, that show is really mean and uh, pretty offensive, and it was trying to be something outrageous to get people's attention. Roundhouse is straight up, I mean, at, at best, uh, PG. At worst, if you said PG-13, I would like, I don't know, man. It really is aimed for families. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it's very interesting how um, they jump around constantly just so fast. You can't even, you can almost not keep up Yeah. with how, how quickly they're switching scene to scene to scene. You're like, you're a kid in one, you're a parent in another, you know, and it's just like they don't really, you, they don't rely on a lot of, like, costume and prop stuff. It's still pretty minimal you know, to move from thing to thing to thing. The uh, the dad shocks me that he didn't run anybody over. Every time I watch that, he's going full fucking speed at everybody, and somehow they get out of the way. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm, like, sweating here. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that guy was one of the main writers, John Crane, who plays dad. He's always going around in this mobile uh, lounge chair complaining to everybody. And, oh, yes. Yeah, and he's a lot of fun, and he's, like, I think the only, like, full-on adult, like, guy out of his 20s. Everybody else looks pretty fresh-faced. Like I said, half of them are from Newsies, so you're talking mostly teenagers or, or early 20s. Mm -hmm. What's the one guy, the one that was definitely recognized instantly? I think I think that was Mark David, the one that kind of has uh, bigger front teeth. Um, he's kind of like their Jim Carrey, uh, really, really skinny brown hair. Um, he almost steals every episode because he has so much energy. 
Uh, are you talking about the guy that was also in Newsies? Yeah, Swollen Glasses. It is Mark David. Okay, I'm looking at a picture of him right here. Yeah. yeah. He almost walks away with the whole show because he's so entertaining and so full of energy. It's a good, you know, there was a, a very unique situation that they had with that show. How long did it uh, run? It was on for four seasons, 13 episodes a season. I think 13, yeah, something like that. Um... So, like, I, that's what I feel like. I feel like they worked out their 13 episodes way ahead of time and rehearsed them and were ready to go. And they would just do a new one every week and, uh, you know, and do it – probably get it completely down until there was no uh, uh, errors or hiccups or anything like that. They, I'm guessing they probably filmed every single performance and finally just aired the one that was good since it was in front of a live studio audience at um, a studio, like a tour studio kind of thing. Yeah, so you could probably get, like, tickets to an episode or something, and <clears throat> so they weren't filming it at, like, Universal Studios Orlando? I think that's where they were filming, so, like, say you went with your family, you paid 50 bucks for the tour or whatever, and then somewhere along the way, they were probably like, okay, everybody, it's a time for a break in our tour to go see a live show, and we're taping Roundhouse right now, would you like to see it? And they did that over and over and over every day. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, I remember going to Universal Studios in Orlando and being in a taping of a show, but I don't remember what the show was. It wasn't something that was really, really cool. Otherwise, I'd remember. When you... I, you I didn't have to get... I was just going to say, you didn't have to get special tickets necessarily either. That was just like, came with the, the ticket to the park and you got to tour like the Nickelodeon Studios or yeah. something. It's not the same, but it reminds me of, and I could be wrong, didn't you do something at like our Heritage Days Festival, or whatever, it, whatever it's called, I can't remember, Fall Festival, where you had to perform a play like six times a day or something? Oh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, I did that a lot. It was like a melodrama, and uh, it's, you know, the nature of a melodrama is pretty obvious because it's right there in the name. Yeah. To be as over the top, and, you know, and you did it like every hour. Yeah, so it's, I, I think it's like that. Maybe not that often because it's much more complicated, but I bet you yeah. they did it numerous times a day. But what amazes me is that these kids are dancing around and they're dancing. They're not doing light dancing. This is fucking like challenging like the, the Los Angeles yes. cheerleaders, you know. The, <laughs> um, these are full on like crazy dances that only a, a young person could possibly pull off because I think I would tear every muscle attempting it. Um, yeah. And then they're going right into a comedy sketch, and they're not out of breath. You don't see sweat. You don't see them out of breath. It's truly impressive. I know. You have to wonder, like, what kind of, like, uh, cardio do they do? You know, that was probably part of it. Like, you guys have to rehearse, but you also have to, like, work out. Yeah. You know. Like, burning probably, like, <laughs> 10,000 calories a day easily. <laughs> probably, yeah. Um, anything else you want to say before we move on? Mm, no, but I would, I, I, other than, I guess of all the shows, uh, you know, that we rewatched or revisited from this time period or earlier, uh, definitely the most sophisticated in, in its writing and, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, production value, I yeah, guess? Yeah, yeah. Maybe? My problem with the last, I think this is the last of the sketch shows, is all that so badly wants to be Saturday Night Live for kids. And yes, instead of yes, having uh -huh. its own identity, and that kind of bothered me. Um, though it is the most successful of the bunch. I mean, there's been revivals, there's been reunions, people still talk about this all the time. There's more stars out of this than any of the shows. And yes. I just... It was fine. Um, of course, the, the, the most popular one probably is the whole Good Burger sketch. It, it fucking kills. I can't believe that Kel isn't more famous than he is because he fucking destroys. Yeah, I think that the, uh, uh, just based on, you know, I listened to Keenan's book recently, and I think the main takeaways from it were, like, uh, the explanation, really, for maybe for Kel is like he one kind of wanted to move away from acting into music. It was really his like 
bigger passion. He always wanted to be a rapper, I guess. Oh, okay. And then the, the second thing was is that he got married and started having a family pretty young. Oh, okay. That explains some things. So I think those are the two main things of uh, why he maybe didn't have the career that he should have. So it's interesting um, that Kel, I believe, well, oh, sorry, Keenan, I believe, has been in sketch comedy unbroken for what, 30 years? I, I almost wonder if it's on purpose. Like, I don't know if he knows this or not, but it's like unbroken. 94 to, and this year will be his 30th year in sketch. Uh, I'm not sure. I think he probably knows. I mean, yeah. how do you, how would you not know no, that? No, I'm sorry. But I'm wrong. There is a gap. So there's a three year gap. I, there was a, a gap where he couldn't get work at all. So, really? and he almost, he almost quit acting. Huh? Cause he's doing Keenan and, and Dr Kel and, at the same time as all of that. Correct. Yes. Yes, that is correct. At I, least part of the time. It was both. Why did I think that he was Fat Albert before he was on SNL? But it shows he was on Fat Albert, or he was on SNL a year before Fat Albert. This is really interesting. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure. I think that he's, he's just been acting for so long that it seems like he's always been acting, and it's so confusing. So, yeah, there was a period of time where he uh, couldn't get work, and he uh, was thinking about quitting, but I think that it is like uh, it was one of those stories like Nick Cage where his accountant like stole all his money. Oh. And it kind of he says that he's in some ways almost grateful that it happened because it made him incapable of giving up because he was broke. He needed to work so he just wouldn't stop trying to get jobs and so that's kind of how this is his 20th anniversary though of being on snl 386 episodes and he was doing yeah. wasn't he doing like his own show just recently on nbc for like three or four years how does he have the internet i will i will tell you that yes he had his own show i think it was on for two seasons uh i wanted very desperately to like it but there was there was something really off about the comedic timing, and I don't know if it's because he was trying to he had Don Johnson of all people to work off of, um, and it was really awkward. And but there was also you know no live audiences I don't think at the time, and there was like a laugh track, and it felt very dated and awkward yeah does that make sense yeah well i mean laugh like, tracks are, no, are there's weird nothing, yeah there's nothing wrong with him i don't think that he's untalented and there was nothing really wrong with the story itself because basically it's like his life kind of okay um to some degree in in the case of the show i believe that like his wife he was a widow and so that's why like don johnson was this like father-in-law or something and he was there to help him raise his kids as opposed to just i mean i think his normal circumstances like yeah just divorce you know i can but, see um, i can see why don would take the job it's something that challenged him that he yes. had never done before he's really funny in eastbound and down but you're talking that's a film thing not in front of a live studio audience probably got multiple takes to get it right and he was yeah. only on i think four episodes out of 30 it had yeah. to be different. I don't know if some people just aren't meant to be in front of a live studio audience. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I have to say you should watch an episode to understand what I mean. Cause I don't want to diss him, Yeah. but I, I, I'm really disappointed for him that that was his fine. His kind of his shot to have his own show. And it just wasn't really worthy of him. I don't think. No, but I also I, I don't understand how Lorne Michaels is able to capture so much magic with SNL, but his two attempts yeah. at doing actually three attempts at doing shows in front of a live studio audience have failed. He did um, yeah. dog on it. I think it's called the the Night Show or something. It was only on for six episodes in 1984, and it had John Candy and a whole bunch of other people, and it was a massive oh. flop. Though I thought it was fucking hilarious. Um, yeah. 
the one that he did with John Mulaney was a huge flop, and they tried fixing it, and it didn't work. And then uh, the was Keenan it the show. John Mulaney show? Yeah, you know the one with Martin Short and uh, Asim Pedrad, I think was her name. Um, it just didn't. Yeah, work. it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't good. Yeah. It was not good at all. And maybe it's the same kind of issues. But I loved. You know, I really liked John Mulaney at the time, and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. But it was like. It was like Seinfeld, but even more awkward. Like, I think Seinfeld's funny, but Seinfeld is, Jerry Seinfeld is not a good actor. And you can see, it, it, when you're watching episodes of Seinfeld, you can see how not good of an actor he is. Yeah. And that everybody else is real. Everybody else is holding him up. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, and that's got... sort of like Mulaney felt, I guess. Yeah. Uh, hey. We're going off track here. I apologize. Um, I know. We don't really need to talk about Amanda Bynes that much because we covered her so much in the episode we did just a few months ago. But she she almost has as many like repeating characters that audiences love and I thought was fun um, as uh, Kel did. I, those two probably win the most uh, repeat worthy characters. Do you mean Kel or do you mean Keenan? I meant Kel. I don't remember Keenan doing that many. Okay. I remember the French talking. Uh, uh, bathtub character, and I remember Goodberg. Well, also, you have to remember that, um, God damn. so all of that, all of that, sorry, not all of that, uh, I'm so cool, kids, all that, um, is not a show that I really knew. By this point, I believe I was in college, so I would only catch a little bit here and there when you would watch it, so I had an idea. I remember that kid, I think his name was Josh. Uh, he looks a lot yeah. different now, but he was the one that was 100% a replica of Jim Carrey. Which, yeah. look, I said this about the kid in Roundhouse. He had some of the same energy, but I didn't feel like he was trying to mimic him. I really feel like either he chose to or the producers made him do it. It's exhausting watching him try to own the show when he clearly doesn't have the, the sketches to back it up. Yeah, I do. I I bet that it was probably a combination decision because I I don't really think the impression that I got at least was that all that they didn't have a lot of creative control over anything. No. And this is from the guys from Head of the Class, Brian Robbins and Dan Schneider, um, and they became like powerhouses. I think I think if we talked about Brian Robbins is now running Nickelodeon, which is weird. And Dan Schneider has been ostracized for apparently really, really bad behavior towards children. Um, I mean, he should be in prison from what I hear. But Oh, really? I didn't know it was that bad. Um, well, maybe not that bad, but I think it's Joss Whedon level. Like, oh, he, okay. had to, he wasn't allowed to be in the same room as people under 18 kind of thing. Oh, okay. Ew. Um, he had, yeah, he was like directing and giving instruction from like... Uh, uh, like a whole different location or in a room by himself because at some point people knew how bad he was and they were c trying to cover for him. Wait, are you talking like shitty behavior, like mean, or was he talking like he likes little girls, little boy, whatever, you know? Um, I think both. I, uh, how do you know he's fucking I, fired? He's fucking fired I'm not, yeah. I'm not really sure, but I heard things about trying to get like teenage girls to talk and okay. um you know yes. really sexualizing them and stuff i don't know but <sighs> there's always a it taint. is sad that it kind of dampers puts a damper on some of the like fun things from my childhood but yeah i had no idea it was that bad um well it makes you wonder if that had an effect on amanda you know what laid the yeah. groundwork is it always been there like part of her or is it i mean i wonder if a lot of these kids ran away from the business because of shit like that I mean, I know that it pushes a lot of kids out anyway because that's just the way the world works. Um, yeah. As you get older, there's more and more competition and they sometimes are more talented. They've had more uh, practice, you know. Um, yeah, the thing is, is, you know, when she's, when, I mean, if we're going to talk about Amanda Bynes, it yeah. seems like she was probably like 10 when she started on all that. And, you know, she was by far the youngest. And I think that, you know, Keenan and Kel were probably like 16 yeah, I 16, believe Lori, Lori uh, was it's the, the oldest. Your yeah, best. I think she was Lori. the only one that was technically an adult at the time. I don't know if she was an adult, but she was definitely the oldest one on the show. And I think that everybody sort of, you know, 
treated Amanda like a little sibling, but it was very clear from the very first episode she was on her immense talent, you know? Yeah. Well, I thought Lori was really funny, too. I Of the yes. stuff I saw, I thought she was really good. That first initial cast is the only one that really made an impression on me. The only thing I remember after that was the kid from Pete Pete, Danny, I think his name is, um, yeah. uh-huh. that he joined the show, and he was kind of the anchor. A lot of it's because people already knew him and were comfortable with him, but it was also like, he's ready to be like the lead, the star. Mm-hmm. There's this kid, I can't remember his name, but he was on Malcolm in the Middle. I remember he was one of the, the Krellborn kids with Malcolm, and he moved over from that over to all that. Hmm. Uh, I can't remember, because I I did recently watch every single episode of Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, uh, really? And, you, um, you, you made it through the whiny years. Okay. <laughs> yep, I sure did. It was really hard for a few years yeah but um yes yeah, so i recently completed it uh and what was my point um and i jumped around a lot with with all that watching various you know several episodes from several different seasons but yeah. I, I just don't... watched i watched the greatest hits reunion whatever you want to call it, like the 10-year reunion it's so funny they're uh-huh. celebrating their 10 years not knowing that there's only like six episodes left and they decided to cancel it. Just, I don't know if the anniversary oh. special was to garner interest to save the show or what, but like that was like spring of 94 and then the show itself like ended like a year later. But I think I was somewhere along the way it came back for a season or two. I think so. I yeah. think so, yeah. Where does Nick Cannon fit into all this? Honestly, I don't know. Okay, it must have been after your time watching it because... All that was kind of a launching pad, and I feel like they were doing the shows at the same time because Amanda Bynes got her own show, and then Josh and Drake somehow came out of that, right? Yeah, well, all the episodes of the Amanda show I watched, um, every single episode had Josh in it, and I mean Drake in it, and I don't know when Josh came along because I watched, I guess, a handful of episodes from season one and two. Okay, so they were never cast members of all that they were just something else i don't think so but again i know i know i haven't seen every episode of all that so i could definitely have missed some things did they have hosts and musical guests on all that or is it just straight up the sketches um no i didn't see any hosts or musical guests on all that ever i'm just curious how much i know i have i know i haven't seen all the episodes so. Yeah, the because uh, I only watched the anniversary special and they had a musical guest and then Frankie Muniz was oh. kind of the host. So oh, um, that's weird. Okay, they had I think it was Cisco was no oh doggone I can't remember who the musical guest was. Um, but it was someone like really early in their career and I think who's that girl that sings Umbrella? Rihanna. I want to say it was Rihanna? Rihanna like when she was first starting and I was like whoa. Yeah, um, but yeah, uh, Frankie Muniz is the host of the special, so I thought maybe that's how the show was. Like, this just they had a guest and a musical person. Maybe at some point they shifted to be more like Saturday Night Live, but yeah. I never saw. I don't recall that. And well, I mean, it has some of the In Living Color flavor too, be, especially with the intro. To, you know, because In Living Color had the one by uh, Heavy D and the Boys, and then they had TLC yeah. do the one for all that. You can yes. see the influence of In Living Color way more than you can SNL. But this one, sketch comedy yes. is a phenomenon. Sketch comedy will never be hotter than it was in the mid '90s because you have uh, SNL is hitting its absolute peak um, audience, like in the early '90s with the frat pack, you know, Adam Sandler and all them. Uh, you yeah. have Kids in the Hall. You have, uh, for super nerds, there was a TV show on Comedy Central called Almost Live out of Seattle where Bill Nye, the science guy, started as Speedwalker. Um, for real? Yeah. Do you remember that? No. Uh, God, was, no. No. You got to watch it. It's really funny. It's very particular to the Pacific Northwest, though. So if you live in Portland, you get the jokes way more. But, um... We had Mr. Uh. Mr. Show, you had The State, uh, of course, In Living Color. Um, but everybody, every there's uh, for all those that people remember, there's a dozen more that had a chance and failed. Like um, Downtown Julie Brown had her own show, uh, a sketch show with Jennifer Aniston. There's um, the John Legozamo show called House of Buggin'. Stuff like that. Mad TV is just about to launch. Sketch comedy was so fucking huge. And besides SNL, I couldn't tell you a single sketch comedy show in the last decade. The Whitest Kid You Know, I think, is the last one. 
I mean, he and Peel? Well, how long ago was that? I guess that was in the last decade, right? I'm not sure when it stopped. That's the first the one that, that pops in my head. Okay. But you're right. You're right. I, I, I understand the point you're trying to make. It's definitely uh, on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, was thinking, I was thinking about other stuff that, that we were super, super into that maybe, uh, yeah, people didn't even realize. I think we were really obsessed with sketch comedy, and I think – so that explains a lot about my personality. Oh, like yeah. Well... Ben, ben Stiller, The State, oh, right. Stella, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kids in the Hall. Whew. Yeah, I just think, it, like, there's a very particular underground comedy kind of coming in around this era. And, um... I don't know, I think... Uh, when I discovered SNL in 1989, it blew my fucking mind. I had never seen anything like it. And we, yeah. I remember renting the tapes. Like, of course, the Eddie Murphy one is the one that really just blew us away because it was so good. But it's just like, oh, my, this works for my attention span. And then we got Comedy Central. Um, yeah. And then, like, not only was it, like, SNL was on every fucking day. Kids in the Hall was on every fucking day. But also you had um, Short Attention Span Theater, which had a mixture of everything. Stand-up, sketches, promos for movies. You know, everything was kind of geared towards clips. And another game, another thing that's like an early uh, TikTok, early YouTube is Comedy Central doing these clip shows for uh, people that just want now, 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 now. Yeah, I guess that explains a lot. I haven't really thought about it. Woo. Um, you know what? This went longer than we ever expected. So I, if it's okay with you, let's split this into two episodes. Okay. All right, let me, uh, everybody, uh, thank you for listening to this episode. We're going to do our short, uh, probably a mini so, but that's what we thought about this too, about game shows geared towards kids in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to this. And Mindy, uh, say goodbye. Bye.